is that I always learn many new things <laughs> from you. And that is quite amazing because I see a lot of talks. So Thank you. I think you guys are in for a great treat. Take us away, Chris. Hi. <laughs> Hope this isn't too, too loud. So thank you, Max. Um, I learned so much just watching that. So let me start off with a couple like disclaimers. I am freaking so nervous right now. My heart is beating so fast. Um, I never talk about what I'm about to talk about just because it's embarrassing. Um, I'm going to tell you about how I hacked a time machine out of my head. Um, and it sounds crazy, but I believe that we're living in a time where we all experience time differently. We all notice things seem faster. And also, I think there's a new sense shaping, almost what's been called a chronoception. I believe it's the next evolution now that we're wired up and we're hacking ourselves. To that end, I'm speaking with some amazing people today. I mean, starting off with Max, all the way through to Alexander and my friend uh, Mateus in the back, we just talked about increasing your memory. So these are people who are like well known for like everything to do with biohacking, and I'm well known for being in the media a lot. So I don't feel I have the credentials, but I'm going to share with you what I did and why I think it's important. So my claim to fame is if you go to Google and you search most connected, just those two words, that's me. Um, <laughs> it used to be the most connected man in the world, and then it was like the most connected man, and now it's most connected. I'm hoping by next year you can just Google most. <laughs> because it's just so much easier when you meet someone. Like if I leave my hotel room keys outside, I just say Google me. Um, they go, oh yeah, it's really you. Um, much of my uh, presentation is going to be about, um, it usually is about the person who did this when you know, I had these pictures taken of Japan with wires coming out of me and everything. But today's presentation is really about what I did after we, I kind of got into quantified self and biohacking. So to talk about a time machine, you first have to talk about time. So there's really two types of time. The first is something called chronoception. And my um, uh, life really is, and your life for that matter, really is about uh, chronology. When I started, it was very simple. I had all these sensors on my body and in my life, and I was collecting all of this information. Everything from the air quality to my heart rate, from what music I listened to, to who I hung out with. It was intense. And all of that information needed to be weighed and needed to be measured in some way that it made sense to me. But more important, I needed to know what was actually important. So to do that, I took all the applications, devices, sensors, and services that I used, and I put them against Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So this is what that looks like. So basically, if you're using Twitter, that's probably not food and shelter. <laughs> Just saying for some of us, it might be. Uh, for Donald Trump, it definitely is food and shelter. For the rest of the world, it's doom. Um, <laughs> it'll be one of those talks. Just get ready. Um, but as you go up, the, you know, as I go up, you know, Dropbox isn't as important, but it provides a work service. So you know, it was that. And I took all of this data and I moved it into Google Calendar. And that's probably what I'm most famous for. I have a Google Calendar going back about 10 years with you know, tens of thousands of data points every single day. I can literally Google everything about my life from my Google Calendar and see it in order. But my life is also about something else that I don't ever talk about publicly until today. And that is the second form of time. So the second form of time is called kairos. And kairos is really the unstructured time that when we experience things. So where chronos is the ordered minute by minute by minute by minute that you know, days equals, you know, weeks equals years. Kairos is really the, the feelings, how things feel. Do you ever get a feeling like it's, it's the right time? Like now is the right time? Or you just meet someone and you get these hunches about time? That really is a second form of time that the Greeks mentioned. I actually measured this too. <laughs> I just never talked about it because it's creepy. What are you measuring this feeling for? And it's <laughs> partly because I noticed that as I got more technology, I wanted to be away from people more <laughs> because people were extremely inefficient and I wanted, you know, I wanted people to act like the internet. You know, if I start to put something in the internet, you get the type ahead. It answers the question before you finish. And it was like, sometimes I just wanted this relationship with people. So I had to figure out what it was that was making people seem inefficient. And it was time. It was like they weren't valuing the time they had or the time with me. So I said, well, what is it about the data and people? 
So I went and looked at my Maslow's hierarchy of needs and found something called the DIKW pyramid. And it basically just said at the bottom layer of life, you've got data. But enough data combined becomes information, right? I mean, maybe it's, uh, you know, kind of correlated in some way. But enough information agreed on by a few people becomes knowledge. That's what we all would generally agree on in the knowledge. And enough knowledge agreed on by people over time we would call wisdom. So it's a pretty, pretty normal stack. You know, I often tell people we live in a world of big data and little wisdom. And I think that's why life sucks. Uh, you've got people quantifying everything, you know? It's just like, and I always say, you know, you don't get better by counting steps. You get better by taking them, right? So uh, this is about how I took the mental steps uh, to make my life better. So these captures didn't go in Google Calendar. These went in photos, and they started in 2011. And what they, I would do is I would mash up photos with data in them and post them to Instagram, because I needed a feedback loop for my friends. So the first ones were simple. They had weather and a picture and the music I was listening to. But then they got a little bit more complex, like they had my gait and my posture, how much time I was spending in places. The pictures actually had a lot more data mashed into them. And then the pictures got a little bit more. They would have, like if I was horseback riding, how fast the horse was going, the temperature, everything else. Riding horses is damn scary. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying, just, just be, be aware. And then, you know, they got much more uh, uh, evolved at the end as I got, like, on things that went faster. So I had to say, what is it about all of these versions of time that I'm collecting and I'm mashing up um, that makes them so powerful? And I realized it was just the intimacy of the data that really changes our perception of time. So things that are very personal or private will change your perception of time very quickly. If someone ever looks over your shoulder when you're on your phone, it feels like forever, right? So what I wanted to do was how do I measure and score now? So I had to look at the original time machine, which Max was talking a lot about the brain, which was the brain, right? So our brains are continually evolving. We've got this reptile brain down at the bottom, the cerebellum and brainstem, and that regulates our heart and a lot of our skin temperature, our respiration. Above that, we have another part of the brain, the mammal brain, uh, which is the limbic system. And that has this, eye, you know, in that part of the brain, we've got our hearing, vision, and speech. Sorry to this side of the room. I always am side sensitive. Um, and then we've got our monkey brain, the primate brain, um, which is the neocortex, which handles things like our emotions, etc. And our brains over time have done this and they've done this really, really well. But this very big evolving brain also controls other things. It controls timing, so the timing of our heart, liver, and kidney functions. Also involves our general sleep and wake cycles and our productivity cycles, and of course, when we do things, all gets driven by light. So there's this whole idea of chronobiology, if you're into that. It's very interesting if you're into chronobiology. But chronobiology really is time machine, right? How do you change and force your body, your muscles, uh, your output, or, or your time? So now, some people will wear, use lights, you know, for seasonal affective disorder. I know here in Sweden, it never gets dark right now. You know, I'm like wide awake at 4 a.m. It's really exciting. No vampire would ever live here. Um, <laughs> um, but beyond this, this system worked really well for humans for centuries. But I think part of the problem is the system now is getting old and doesn't make a lot of sense. Because nowadays, if you think about that, that system drove our, how we made sense of the outside world. So our environment, our, um, the world around us, we made sense of because of the time we understood from our own internal bodies. The next part of our brain then made sense of the organizations around us, whether they were cultures or societies, manufacturing, education. And then finally, our front part of our brain made sense of time as it relates to other systems. We started off with things like commerce, we got into fashion, arts, and then media. But then we went a step further, and that's where we are today. This whole idea of these analog systems give rise to digital systems. So the digital systems in our lives are always on, they're always connected, and they're always getting information faster and pushing them to our brains. So our brains, even if you don't biohack, are becoming cybernetic just because your feedback loop is ridiculous. I mean, have you ever noticed it takes like half a second to get a credit card transaction pushed to your phone? I mean, it almost knows you're spending money before you spend it, right? It, yet it takes like five minutes to sync your Fitbit. Right? There's some economic thing there we need to talk about at some point. So as our brains become robots, we need to look at, is it possible now to hack time? Can we slow time, speed it up, et cetera? And I believe we can, and I'm going to show you how I did that now. Um, so the first thing is we need to understand that the basics of time machines. So there's the now, there's the now here, the now here you, and we'll get into this. So how does this work? So the now is very simple. 
we've had now forever, we call it a clock. It's the thing that feels like it's driving us crazy, that we're always like, is it over, is it over, is it over? Or you don't want it to end. Uh, clocks haven't changed very much, but they're evolving a bit. So we now have the now here. So if you think about that, these are two examples of clocks that are just started getting sold in the United States recently. Um, they're very powerful because you'll notice one clock is a complete day or a complete season. So what's happened is you can't really have a, a, a complete day or complete season without having here, right? Because this season is different than Argentina. So clocks that actually work in this way work with now here. Even though you would say time is time, now time is also dependent on place. This is important for my time theory. All right, so now we've got here you. And you know, Aki, we only have time for the Zelda people in the booth. Some people get my slides, some people go, what the hell is he doing? All right, but you've now got now here you. So Apple Watch keeps track of how fit you are all day long. Notice it looks like a clock face and you get these rings. So now time is based on steps. And I'm sure you've seen people who've said to you, gosh, I've gotten 10,000 steps and it's only 10 a.m., right? Are they a step counter or are they living? I mean, what, what is the life? And if you've ever met a gym nut, they live like, you know, how many hours of cardio, et cetera. So past that, you now have the now, here, you, then. And this is you know, a really interesting look at how time is evolving. So this is a 10,000 year clock. Um, it's being built in the desert out in the Sierra Diablo desert. It actually takes care of tracking 10,000 hours at a time. So it's a very long view of time. So as our bodies change from the now to the now here to the whole you to like this very long period of time, you'll see that we're starting to mess with it. So what do you need to do to build and use this time machine that I've created? You need hardware, software, and hardware and software together. So like a good Apple product. Um, <laughs> So the hardware is pretty simple. Um, we've got hardware all around us. It's in your car, it's in your homes, uh, you wear it, it's in your phone. So any place you see a screen that's connected to the internet, you can build a time machine. Um, the next thing you need is software. So what kind of software? Well, believe it or not, you guys are already using time machine software. We have it in our photo apps, so things that show us the past, the real far past that group our years together. Our, our uh, time machine also now groups together memories using artificial intelligence. If you've ever used Apple Photos and see the memory section, it's actually mashing up time for you automatically and saying what's relevant. Um, other places you see time for software is you manage your memories through Facebook. Have anybody ever edited their, their on this day? I mean, it's like eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. You can just go back and scrub out people from your life, but you can do that now. Um, we also uh, uh, manage anniversaries in Facebook. Um, and as some of you know, you can actually go in and set up your death now in Facebook. You can say, hey, if I die, do this. You can manage the future uh, in Facebook. But hardware and software together is, is interesting. This actually has existed for a while. So how do you create a time machine with these two things merged together? A lot of people remember Google Glass, but they don't know something amazing about Google Glass. So I was part of a team of people that got to design an interface with Google, the Google Now team that ended up getting used in Google Glass. And it was time. You don't believe me, but wait till you know this. So this is cool. So what Google Glass did was it showed you the now when you first turned it on, which was the time and the phrase, OK, Glass. And it would just pop up and ask you something. If you swiped backward, it would show you things in the past. But if you swiped forward in Google Glass, it would show you things in the future. It's pretty cool, right? You're like, well, how does it know in the future? Well, we know some things about the future. We know basically a weather forecast. We know any appointments that are coming up. Um, and you'll see there's a lot more we know about the future than we think we know. But I did interesting things with Google Glass that I never really talked about. This is a picture from my Google Glass. I hacked it to tell me to shop less. So during holidays, if I was spending too much money on my credit card, which was feeding into my back end, it would actually send me alerts if I spent too much money in a certain place. And if it thought I was going to, it would tell me in the future, don't spend money today. It's going to get really freaking crazy in here. Hold on. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm telling you, we're going to go there hardcore. So, um, so we all know that this is what, and also Apple Watch is the world's biggest time machine that most people have. So it shows you the time now. Obviously, we know time. Like I said, it'll all show you your appointments. It'll show you your body, um, and it'll show you the globe. But what most people don't know about Apple Watch is it's got a function in it called time machine. So if you scroll forward on the digital crown, it will show you the weather later on today. It'll move the moon. It'll show you your appointments as you go through the day. If you do it on the earth, it'll show you where the position of the globe is. And I had some really great slides in here of how this worked, but I didn't want to go over my time. But like in Sweden, you can see like your sun never goes down because it shows you backwards and forwards in days. So how do we experience this? So now this is where we get into like how I uh, vision this will work in the future. So obviously, we already experienced this through photos for things that to do with the past. We experience now with technology through anything on demand, 
movies, videos, services. We experience soon through AI, and we experience the future through things like music. So for example, this is another good uh, shown here. So Apple Music and Spotify will both show you the songs that are coming up in your queue. You think it's just doing you a favor, but it's showing you the future, right? If you didn't pay attention, this would happen. Are you with me? Because it's important that you understand you can control the future today. By the time we leave here, you'll all be like, you know, disappearing out of here. Just like Apple Watch, if I scroll forward on the digital wheel, it'll show me the songs that are going to play tonight, right? So if, as your life becomes more automated and you allow technology to do more, you literally could live in the future if you knew how to access it and harness it. So I built a, um, an instruction manual for time, uh, and this is how it works. You collect, you trigger, you filter, you feedback, and you change the experience. This is the temporal design algorithm that I constructed that I've never shared before. But basically, you take the data you collect from the world, you then push it through a filter, you then, oh, it looks like I got cut off a little bit. Um, and then there's another step and you're going there, but I break these down pretty easy for you. So the first thing is the tr trigger, and the trigger can come in. So once you've collected something like, you know, you're, uh, activity data, you then uh, trigger it by a location or by a state, or in this type, we're gonna look at an alternate time, you then filter it by a location because you don't wanna have some, some alerts happening while you're driving, you might crash. And the last thing you do here is you create an ambient feedback loop. So you give your mind a gentle nudge to believe that it's in a different time. And I'll, I'll show you an example of this. So the first thing is very simple. You frack your phone. You find a way to get all the information out or as, it, as enough information as you can. Once you've fracked your phone, you create a trigger. So these triggers are really important because triggers are t biological temporal triggers are tied to feelings, plain and simple, right? So things that make time seem fast are closer to the mandala at the center. Things that make things seem like they last forever are the further out. So I encourage you just to look up a feelings mandala. You'll notice it maps to technology pretty simply. The next thing you do is you create this filter, and like I said, you can filter on time, location, activity, behavior, biology, or environment. So these are the things you would look for, and then you'll push it through a grid. Now, this is a very simple grid I created, but you can create one yourselves. List time, date, location, activity, but then list like what is type of activity, walking, running, behavior, uh, unlocking your phone, looking at your calendar, uh, biology, you know, blood, heart rate, uh, respiration, environment, temperature, uh, humidity, et cetera. So do you understand the, the stack here? So you just do it one way and the other way, and then you just put a number someplace, and you'll have two data points, and then you'll understand that's something you can trigger time on. The next thing you do is you create an ambient feedback loop, and as we've already seen, you can do this with applications, so applications that are historic in nature, the past, now, soon, the future, or uh, someday. So in the user experience, how do you measure, or is your time machine working, right? Because now you're like, well, wait a minute, how do I know that he's telling the truth? How will I know that I actually created a time machine? Or a feedback loop to trick your mind. So the first way is, if it happens now, then you know you did something right. Setting an alarm is proof that tomorrow will come, because you can set an alarm for tomorrow morning, right? <laughs> you know it worked. But if, have you ever had a piece of technology make you think, oh, that's coincidental? Do you ever have that happen where you're like, oh, how does that happen? Like Facebook, you always see like on this day, and you're like, how did that happen exactly one year ago today? And we'll notice a lot more people are noticing this more than happened. It's because you're already hacking time. You just don't think about it this way, and no one's ever told you how to do it more. The next way to do it is deja vu, right? So where you think you've done something before, uh, group deja vu, we're calling the Mandela effect. <laughs> Um, and then you look for serendipity, where like two of you experience something at the same time. And if all of us experience something at the same time, we call it synchronicity. So anytime you see any of these markers and you've put a time experiment in your life, you've been successful. Right? So I showed you how, kind of the basics, and I did this in half an hour, sorry about that. Do an experiment and look for this to be the outcome, because if it happens, you time traveled. Right? It's just your mind. So now let's talk about how we can do this. So speeding time, that's pretty simple. Live, live like you're living today. It speeds time. That means listen to your devices. When, you're, when your watch tells you to stand up, stand up. When it tells you to meditate, meditate. Your life will go very fast if you let a machine tell you what to do. <laughs> All right? Uh, next, any application that tells you it's going to save you time, don't use it. It speeds time up. The minute someone tells you it'll be faster, you count time quicker. Right? Don't do it. Take the slower route. It will be faster. Trust me. We're hacking time, all right? Last thing is don't put your calendar on the front page. D don't stare at it. It's going to make time move quicker. And then, of course, get rid of the battery percentage. But now let's get in a reliving time, real simple, right? So like I said, you can already do this with photographs. It's pretty straightforward. Best way to relive time is through maps. So photographs on maps. Apple does this. Um, next thing is count-ups. 
right? So this is how you start to slow things down in your mind. So uh, if you want to relive time, instead of doing countdowns to certain days, let them keep going and use applications that count up. You'll notice it starts to change the perception and pulls those events forward quicker. And then finally, one thing I really like is you can collect information, like my fiance who's sitting in the front row here, he collects music that we listen to using Spotify and photos. Then what we can do is we can create a Spotify playlist with those um, uh, songs in it. So we have our whole Euro playlist. And then what we can do is we go home and create a temperature, playlist, lighting, and even scents that match that memory. But the trick to that type of time travel is to only do it at about 30%. Because if you do all those settings, the volume, the, the, uh, the smells, the temperature, the humidity, the sound, all of that, and the lights at 100%, your mind goes, this isn't Christmas, it's July. So you have to subtly move it in, and then your mind will start to go backward in time. So reliving is, is not as cool as I think is slowing time down. So how do you slow time down? Well, one of the fastest ways is to change your lock screen to give you a message right away. Right? So the minute you pick up your phone, it's going to be a time machine. It's going to tell you, stop doing what you're doing, do something else. Right? This is pretty straightforward. Another way we can um, uh, slow time up is using, sorry, I'm going the wrong way now, lock screen calendars and alarms. So we already know that if you have Google Calendar, it will let you schedule things into your life, like learn to meditate, learn to go for a run. You can use Apple's alarm to actually schedule uh, your sleep. Um, the next thing is stop counting. Do you ever notice Facebook has all of these uh, numbers in it? So things like, you know, how, how long something, sorry, this clicker's been a little bit crazy on me. How long something's been, oh, sorry about that how long something's been online, and then how many people have, have responded to it. There's a, something by a guy named Ben Grosser called the Facebook Decrementer, and you can run it, and it's a plugin that removes all of those numbers. Notice they're all missing from that second screen. Oop, sorry about that, guys. They promised me this worked. Um, so once that's all missing, when you don't see numbers on Facebook, Facebook's a lot easier to use, and time actually changes your perception of it, because the problem is we're getting hijacked our time sense in Facebook. Um, the next, and look up Ben Grosser on Google, it works really good. And the next thing is to pause time. So how would you pause time? Well, the easiest way to pause time, sorry about that, are home screens. So one of the things I do every year, and I've done it for the last 10 years, is I take a screenshot of my home screen once a month, and then I review them. So just like a selfie that you see your evolution, your home screen actually is a way to pause time. So I do something called iPhone palmistry, where I, I look at people's phones and I tell them about their lives. Some people have seen me do this at conferences. Um, but like, you never want to have all your icons at the bottom. You want to have like, at least one space. And when you can, you want to have a blank front screen. You'll find that really pauses time for you. Um, the second thing is working with applications that change time. So one of the great things that you can do with email now is snooze it. And one of the, my favorite features about snoozing email is picking someday or never or later. Again, that will slow time down. You don't have to feel like you have to answer every single email. Um, the next way that we can slow pause time down is this idea of social media. So we've all used Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram, um, uh, and Snapchat, but this is my phone doing a live demonstration or a video of it. You'll notice I'm going to come back here and you notice all my social media icons look completely different than the ones on the screen. When I launch them, they actually have wrappers on them. So every single app I use that makes me want to speed time up has a digital wrapper on it. Did you notice how it stopped and started breathing? Right? So that's something called Get Space. You can download off the internet. It puts a wrapper on every single application you use and makes you slow down when you use it. So the idea is to stop on the moment, not quite get right into that thing. Um, the next thing that I really love about uh, time hacking is hacking the soon enough. So we have all know that going to bed and getting sleep is so, so important. So you can do that by creating alarms on your bed, but more importantly, you can use applications that tell you to do things. So I have applications that tell me not to drink caffeine at certain times, not to watch TV, not to read books, not to start a movie at 11.30 at night when I can't sleep. Um, and then I love this idea of hacking monkey time. So monkey time is working with your brain to make it more sensitive to how much time pressure is on it. Obviously, I would suggest everyone learn to meditate. I'm a Shambhalian Buddhist. Uh, I, I prefer meditating. I don't think you need tech, but some people need tech to start. Um, the next thing you can do to kind of work with the monkey is, sorry about that, um, change your home screen. So you'll notice that your home screen oftentimes will be ordered with a lot of information that you don't need or a lot of information that's putting pressure on you. So my home screen ordered from left to right has information about my diet and my behavior. From there it goes into the weather and the world. Weather and world always slows you down after you look at your body. From there it goes right into your actual calendar. 
From that calendar, it goes into any bills and or tasks, and then it goes into memories. So order your home screen temporarily, not by urgency, and you'll notice you can start to actually pulse the brain and work with that monkey that's telling you you've got a lot to do. Um, and then I always like, I call this connect to your divinity. So name your devices things that you value. So my watch is called kindness. My, uh, my phone is called open your heart. So whenever I airdrop or connect to anything in my life, it's a subtle reminder to stop and what's important to you, right? You shouldn't connect to iPhone when you can connect to love. <laughs> this, is, this is not hard shit, right? I don't know why we're not doing this and like thinking about, because the world seems scarier to me in some ways. Um, and then finally, um, this section here, designed by value. So in my Mac, all my folders are actually sorted by values, not by, by last access, so hope um, is one of my values. Um, um, work in progress, love, happy is a value. And then on my iPhone, I actually, the apps I have to use that I want to use, I put those in folders and I name the folders the feelings they invoke. So avarice, pride, delusion, lust, greed, <laughs> burden, distraction, disorder. So again, I'm, I'm in touch with the feeling that that app is gonna force me to actually provoke. And then uh, focusing on tenderness. So if you have to use tasks and alarms and reminders, make sure they tell you something that's important to you and have them come to you throughout the day. So my task list always has things in it like my partner loves me, I need to move slow, tomorrow's not promised. But then I have these reminders that get sent to me throughout the day that remind me of things like focus on other people, be kind. You don't need an alarm to get up and go to the bus. You need an alarm to get up and be nice to each other. Trust me. That's the most important thing you can do with this biohacking is set up an alarm to tell, be nice to yourself. Um, and then from there, you know, I love reminders. Reminders actually have context sensitive. So when I get in my car, my car tells me, use this drive to notice your body. So it's the context of getting in car. When I get out of my car, notice your body, your hands, the weather. So entering and exiting places are triggers for reminders about what's important to me. Um, and then finally, um, uh, creating magic. So focusing on the road less travel. I use a lot of applications that use push messages that come via location because there's nothing more magical than being told something at a location. When I get to work, it always tells me don't kill anyone today. Um, <laughs> I love this application. I used it for the longest time. It basically looked at my route I took everywhere I went and every time I went would offer me a way I hadn't gone before. So don't be optimized, learn and see something new. You meet more people by doing things you didn't expect than anything else. And then sleep and life, one of my favorite sleep apps is made here in Sweden. So this is showing me my sleep, but this one's showing my sleep as it relates to the moon cycle. So full moons, I'm like totally not sleeping well. Um, I should basically do uh, strength training, not cardio, uh, if I wanna actually stay well. And then create a fortune. Um, this is a great app I love to use. If I, if I log what I eat, I can see what I'll weigh. If I eat that way every day, it'll say in five weeks, you'll weigh this. If I have a donut, it then updates itself and says, nope, you'll weigh this. So again, apps as time machines are really super, super powerful because they allow you to see what things will be in time. Um, and then finally, this idea of um, talk to where and when you are. So I love Evernote. Evernote allows you to put notes in places. So my presentation for today was actually tied to this building. So it was here when I walked in. Right? Um, but something else is I use Evernote times in the date, uh, notes in the future. So I have notes that are popping up when future events are happening, but also when future life events are happening. You'd be amazed how much techno-paganism I've created by just forcing things into existence by putting notes in the future. Um, which leads me to my last hack, which is my absolutely favorite one. So this idea of designing tomorrow now. So I started using a system about five years ago where I would write to myself an email. And this email would go to a, to a repository and then it would be randomly sent back to me in the future. Well, after using this for two years, I realized these emails I was writing to myself were pretty, pretty negative. So it dawned on me, wait a minute, if I'm writing an email that's gonna send, be sent back to me, couldn't I write the email nicer? I mean, it's me writing it and it's gonna come back to me. So I started actually engineering the words I used with myself in the future. And when those emails started coming back to me, it started changing my behavior now. Do you understand? So what I did was I engineered the now. That what this presentation came, is happening because I told myself I was going to do it when I saw Mateus, who you'll see later, a few months ago, right? So I totally engineered the moment by keeping sending myself these messages. It's very, very powerful. That's all I really have. Um, hopefully, you'll take a look at the presentation. I'll make it accessible to everyone. I do think that you can use the synchronicity, the serendipity, um, the coincidence with some of the hacks I've shown you to actually prove that we can time travel. 
Um, I'm very excited about the rest of the day, but like I said, be really kind to each other. It's really scary out there right now, and I think technology is a big part of it, so hack your heart. Thank you.